All right. My name is Tiffany Keith, and I am one of the program managers for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for our Disability Awareness Month event as we prepare to close out with just one more event tomorrow. But today, we have physical therapist Melissa Lakes presenting her research on using adaptive dance and exercise to improve outcomes in people with brain injuries. Melissa Lakes is a senior physical therapist and certified brain injury specialist. Uh, she received her doctorate degree in physical therapy in 2017 after graduating from Hunter College DPT program and has been working at Mount Sinai ever since. Uh, she has experience in a variety of settings, including acute inpatient care, brain injury rehabilitation, and is currently working in the outpatient physical therapy department, treating patients with various musculoskeletal and neurological disorders. Melissa believes in using movement as medicine and as a physical therapist is able to utilize her extensive knowledge about the body to, and exercise to help her patients heal and recover from all types of injuries. So just some house, housekeeping before we get started. Um, this session will be recorded and posted to our social media platforms. Uh, this session is also eligible for social work continuing education credits as well as psych continuing education credits. We encourage everyone to stay until the end, but to get the full credit for psych, please note there will be two check-in links in the chat at the 15 minute mark and as well as to the close of the uh, presentation. Um, there is also closed captioning available. To access, please click on live transcript at the bottom of the screen. Click show subtitles and you will be able to see those closed captionings. Um, we also have Q&A available. If you have any question, please put them in the Q&A and we will answer them towards the end of the webinar. So without any further ado, I will hand it over to Melissa Lakes. Thank you, Tiffany, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. So yeah, just like Tiffany explained, um, I'm a physical therapist at Sinai. Um, and as you know about physical therapy or may not know, we use movement um, as, our, as our tool, as our medicine. And I do believe that movement is medicine, which is why I basically went into the field. Um, and it's great because we work from patients in all different walks of life, all different levels. And the greatest thing is that we are able to meet patients where they are. Um, in their recovery journey, whether it be from stroke, um, ACL injury, shoulder, knee, uh, any type of orthopedic issue or neurological. Um, and the, the field has expanded greatly to also include you know, pelvic health um, and, and other things as well, wound care. But we won't get into that. Today, we're gonna talk about um, how to use adaptive dance and exercise to improve outcomes in patients with brain injury. Um, so about, uh, well, two years ago at the start of the pandemic, 2020, I was rotated from acute care working in inpatient with uh, patients in the hospital, acutely ill, to working in the brain and on the brain injury unit. Um, and it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, I had never worked with someone with stroke or TBI uh, formally, um, only as a student under the guidance of a clinical instructor. So this was like a whole new world for me. Um, and I got really interested in using different techniques. And one of the things that I wanted to look further into was using dance as an adaptive tool. Um, why? Well, um, you know, we do a lot of gait training for the stroke population and or anyone with brain injury, trying to help them regain functional mobility, meaning being able to move better, provide the right assistive devices, helping them with their balance, all of these things. Um, and so we have to use evidence-based treatment practice. Um, and one of them is definitely high intensity gait training. Um, and another thing that I was interested in looking at was using dance and using music and rhythm and things like that. Um, and seeing if there was a place for this um, in our rehabilitative therapeutic activities. And so I, I did some research and um, came up with uh, this presentation. So let's jump right in. Oh. There we go. So um, our, object our objectives are gonna be to review the benefits of dance as a therapy tool, 
and discuss the impact of dance um, in various neurological populations. So ultimately my goal was to look at it with, with stroke patients, but there is a place for it through the spectrum of patients or people with any type of uh, neurological disorder and including just being of older age. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, I have a few videos to provide a demonstration of what adaptive dance may look like um, in real life. And then we'll kind of wrap up with a take home message and Q&A as Tiffany had discussed. So I like this quote, um, wherever the dancer steps, a fountain of life will spring from the dust by Rumi. So just kind of letting that settle in. Um, I don't know who or who out there has any experience with dance, but I was raised on music and rhythm and getting into a dance class from a very young age. So this is something that's all a part of me that I wanted to bring into my work environment and share with patients as well. So what is dance? Um, it's a form of human physical activity. It involves synchronizing the whole body with movements, sometimes with music and sometimes without music. It's basically pattern rhythmic movement through space. There's timing involved. And it was a very early or primitive form of human communication and human expression, right, in our history. And it involves multi-sensory stimulation. We hear, we touch, we move, um, it's physical. And there's also a social interaction. And that social component is where a lot of the healing also occurs, not just the moving part, not just the balance and rhythm, but also the socialization that can occur when you're, when you're dancing, especially in a group setting. So we all know that there are different forms of dance. Um, ballet is one of the classical types of dance that we see performed um, to classical music. Um, dancing on your toes, partners, different formations. We also have ballroom dancing, right? Partner dancing um, from the waltz to the tango, the foxtrot, rumba, salsa, merengue. And these come from all different parts of the world as well. Jazz is a mix of uh, ballet with kicks and leaps, turns, um, Broadway, things of that nature. And then there's also folk dancing, which may have more of a cultural impact, right? From different parts of the world, different cultures, um, representing your heritage through, through dance. Line dancing also performed in large groups where everyone's following the same steps and moving in different ways. And if you never did line dancing, it's a lot of fun. Um, a more modern type of dance would be, well, there's also modern, I didn't list it, but that's also there as well. Uh, hip hop, um, which involves elements of all of ballet, jazz, um, uh, and African kind of mixed into one, more of a modern take. And then there's also tap dancing using more of like percussion with your feet, which is also a lot of fun. So we talk about the different forms of dance, we know what it is, but what are the benefits of dancing? Well, uh, from a health perspective, there are cardiovascular benefits because it is, it is a form of physical activity, especially if you're doing some type of um, uh, faster moving, faster paced dancing. It could even be considered high intensity, like Zumba, if anyone takes Zumba classes. I used to be an instructor, so I have first uh, hand experience. Um, it also increases your muscular strength. If you see, um, you know, a, trained dancers performing. You can see the muscle in their bodies and how strong they are to perform these powerful leaps and jumps. Not that, that we have to do that, but even in the everyday person who goes um, to a class in their neighborhood or taking a class through Zoom can still reap the benefits of building muscular strength. Um, definitely builds endurance and flexibility, right? You, um, it, because it is it involves moving over a period of time so that helps you build your stamina um, and flexibility as you improve the length of your muscles through stretching, through some of the kicks and, and just moving through a full range of motion. Um, one of the greatest benefits and the things that we, especially as physical therapists look at is, is how it helps you with your, your balance. So static balance, meaning staying in one position versus dynamic balance that involves moving, turning, twisting, pivoting, moving from one foot to the other foot, all things that we aim to do as therapists to prepare our patients for real life when they have to get out there in the street and then look both ways, dual tasks, meaning keeping something in your mind as you're moving and, and going about your day. 
Um, and then also another really important thing is increased reaction time. So being able to adapt very quickly to things changing in your environment, right? Um, being quick, being alert, um, and without losing your balance and ending up falling, which is what we're always trying to reduce. Um, on the other side, we also have some of the more social emotional benefits of dance. So that's improved social emotional well-being overall, especially when you're in a group setting. You're, uh, there's a meditative piece where you're, you're very mindful of what you're doing. You have to kind of focus in on, on the steps. On if there's choreography, follow the instructor or follow a group. Um, it does, there is a proof that there, it reduces stress and even depression in certain people can help someone increase their self-confidence, their self-esteem. And, and especially as we age, and we're all aging at various levels in our lives, we're all heading into that older age, um, it reduces cognitive decline, mostly because of the cardiovascular effects and just being an exercise form in general. So the biggest question is, can dance be used as a therapeutic tool um, in the therapeutic setting? So when we ask this question, we want to look at who we're targeting and how feasible it is to actually use it. So our population um, here at Sinai, or well, at least where I, where I was working in, in the brain injury unit and now, excuse me, as an outpatient physical therapist, it's primarily adults and adults with motor disorders. So anything from a movement disorder, a neurological disorder, or anyone even coming in with just chronic pain or generalized pain, that's still considered a movement disorder or motor disorder because it's affecting how they move, how they move through their full range of motion, uh, perform a sport or just their regular everyday activities and lives. And then feasibility is looking at um, performing this intervention, a dance therapy intervention with an individual um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis versus in a group setting. And how you know, we have to look at safety. We have to look at um, if someone is prone to losing their balance, how are we gonna prevent them from falling, especially if you're in a group setting, right? So we're looking at these different parameters um, to make this a safe, a safe and effective tool. So one of the things that I found, we're gonna kind of get a little bit into some of the research and evidence um, is that it, dance is can be used to reduce perceived pain. And this is really important as PTs because we're always dealing with pain. People are always coming to us in pain, even if they've had a stroke and they're really there to work on their balance and their gait, they still may have pain, whether it's neuropathic um, or you know something related to their nerves or just because they're having some orthopedic issues as well. So this is a study um, by Ho et al. 2016. They, took a, they looked at 139 patients who were, uh, were diagnosed with breast cancer, and they randomized them into two, two groups, a dance therapy group, and then a weightless control group. So one group was receiving dance therapy six times a week or six sessions for one and a half hour, twice, twice a week, um, over the course of a three-week period where they were receiving their radiotherapy treatment. And then the other group, the control group, um, was on a wait list. So they were going to receive this, this dance therapy treatment, but just three weeks later. So they can see, look at them side by side, a group that was just receiving radiotherapy versus the group that was receiving radiotherapy plus um, this dance movement. And what they found was that um, through, they, they collected data basically through questionnaires on stress, on depression, uh, how their coping skills were. And what they found was that the patients um, that received the dance therapy perceived their stress, pain, and um, how pain interfered with their lives to a much lesser extent than the group that received radiotherapy alone. Um, and then this, this had a p-value of less than 0 0.05, so there is a significant difference there. So that really is kind of showing how dance is effective to reduce pain. Another important factor is that, especially looking at someone with, uh, from a neurological standpoint, or even just people in general um, who wanna just improve how their body works and functions is integrating brain functions, right? The brain controls the entire body. So we're looking at kinesthesia, which is basically perception of movement. We're looking at motor control or how someone graze their movement as they're going through the walking or gait cycle or just standing and balancing or in your kitchen cooking or preparing a meal. There's a component of memorization, right? Especially if, if you're following a group, a class, a, a type of dance, there's choreography involved. Even if it's just stepping side to side, like in the merengue, 
um, you're moving side to side, you're moving forward back, or you're coordinating with your partner. Oftentimes, dance involves music. So there's a musicality, there's interpretation of music, there's perception, and then there's the emotional piece as well. So one of the things as PTs, um, anyone in the medical field, we're always looking towards neuroplasticity. So this is the idea that the brain can change itself. Um, and when someone with a stroke or brain injury or with MS, Parkinson's disease, the brain changes um, just because of the nature of that disease or what's happened as, as far as an injury to the brain. Um, parts of the brain become affected negatively. And so with neuroplasticity, we want to, neuroplasticity basically means that the brain can form new connections, build new connections to uh, recreate the movements, the sensations or whatever it had been lost due to that injury or disease process. So we wanna, as therapists, we're always looking for ways to promote neuroplasticity, to pr promote the brain being able to heal itself and strengthen those connections between the cerebral hemispheres, the two right and left halves. So in this systematic review uh, by Tejera Machado, 2019, they took a look at a randomized clinical trial that investigated dance, the effect of dance on neuroplasticity. Um, what they basically found was that there were great changes in the brain, both functionally and then also structurally. So it, they found that um, through looking at different scans of people who had gone, undergone um, these uh, dance therapies that there was an in increase in the hippocampal and gray matter, as well as an improvement in the white matter integrity. There was also a great improvement in memory, attention, and balance. All things that we need as human beings to be able to function in life, right? We need to hold things in our memory um, in order to get our work done, in order to live our lives. We need to be able to have attention to the task at hand. And then balance is super important because if we don't balance, we fall and we, don't, we can't hold ourselves up in the world. So the first population that we'll sort of look at is um, older adults. And I'm not saying that they have neurological anything, but this is a great population where dance can be a, a therapeutic tool or intervention, and especially working in a hospital as all, all of us do. Um, we work with people, unless you're working in pediatrics, you're working primarily or with a, a large majority of your patients are older adults, right? So um, there's just the natural aging process, which is irreversible and continuous, and it goes on throughout our lifespan, but it does impact our mobility, um, our memory, our ability to care for ourselves, our independence, and it can be accelerated by illness, which is why people come to Mount Sinai Hospital, or just physical inactivity. And I bolded those two because especially inactivity, um, if you spent time with an older adult, grandparent, neighbor, whatever, um, oftentimes, there is this sense of isolation as we as uh, adults age, um, and there's a need for being social. There's a need for getting moving and being active, and we see this as therapists a lot. Patients come in with back pain. They come in with um, a knee away or whatever, and a lot of times the first thing they do is stop moving, and when you stop moving, well, the body needs motion in order to kind of heal itself and to stay strong. Um, if you've ever heard the expression, uh, use it or lose it, that's classic here. Um, I use that often to explain and educate patients that you have to keep moving, even if there is some pain. Oftentimes, the reason why you're in pain is because you stopped moving and you've sat too long and inactivity, right? So that's inactivity and illness kind of go hand in hand. Um, yes, and so here there's another reason why inactivity is really detrimental to the older adult. There's a high correlation between physical activity um, in older adults and uh, poor postural control, which can lead to falls. And falls in America affect people 65 and older a great deal. Falls are, um, they, a lot of patients end up with brain injuries, hip, um, hip fractures, all sorts of things. And uh, there's always a negative sort of sequela that occurs after this. So we want to prevent falls. We were looking at prevention um, as well. So um, something that, that older adults are kind of fighting against, um, the fact that you need to have adherence to a program um, of, of movement, right? You need, you need something that's gonna keep you going. You have to stay consistent, right? They're also fighting the sedentary lifestyle. It's easy once you're retired, maybe if you weren't so active in your life to begin with, to just become even more inactive and um, end up 
sitting most of your day, spending a lot of time indoors. Um, so you're kind of more socially isolated, which can then lead to uh, a depressed mood um, emotionally. And then all of these things kind of lead to, can also lead to cognitive decline because you're not using those faculties as, as often as you would previously. And then all of these different uh, pieces can lead to a higher risk for falls as well. So basically it means that for the older adult, there's a need for physical activity that is enjoyable, that's sustainable, and that promotes socialization. All of the things that um, we're kind of fighting against, right? So enjoyment is a huge one because if you don't enjoy the activity that you're doing, are you likely to continue doing it? No, <laughs> you're gonna move away from something that's either painful, annoying, boring, whatever. You wanna do something that's gonna be sustainable. Um, there needs to be some variety involved, right? Um, if you keep doing the same thing over and over, your body kind of adapts and then loses the, the flexibility to change to a changing environment or different things that can challenge your body in new ways. Um, you need something that's low cost. Not everybody can afford to go to Equinox down the street or to these fancy boutique gyms or, or, or whatever to get exercise, right? So we need something that's available. Um, and then has a preventative approach, something that can be uh, used as a tool to um, be like a, prevent basically any negative situations, loss of balance, falls. So what does dance do? It kind of fills in those gaps, right? For many people, it's enjoyable. Not everybody, that's fine. Choosing, choose an activity that's enjoyable to you, but today we're talking about dance. So finding an activity that's enjoyable. There's variety, right? We've talked about all the different types of dance. So there's so many different forms to choose from. Low cost, you can literally turn on music and then just go, right? No one has to know what you're doing. You can just dance in your own living room, your own house and, and have fun. And then it's preventative because if you're, if you're moving, and you don't stop moving, then you don't become sedentary, you don't um, lose that physical activity, you're staying strong, you're staying mobile. So basically, um, to wrap up for older adults, the benefits, especially for people who are dancing regularly, they have a more stable gait pattern, meaning that they're not um, sort of in, uh, showing signs of instability or, um, for lack of better terms, that their gait kinematics are just are more normalized. Uh, they have better balance and they have faster reaction time. So if they need to make a quick movement or quick adjustment on the go, they're able to do that without a loss of balance, right? There's also aerobic benefits, just like walking or jogging because you're continuously moving, you're building that stamina and endurance. Um, and it's an enjoyable experience. You turn on music that you like. Maybe you're dancing with your friends. There's an enjoyable uh, emotional well-being that's being addressed here. And that's going to reduce stress and that's going to reduce also your risk for depression. All right, so we're going to get into the next uh, population, uh, Parkinson's disease. So this is a, neuro a neurodegenerative disorder that often affects elderly folks. Um, this is basically degeneration of a part of the brain that creates uh, dopaminergic neurons and located in the part of the brain known as the substantia nigra. Um, and this causes deficiencies in the neurons of the basal ganglia and those control uh, your motor movements, all of the, the premotor cortex, all of the, the things that control movement, right? So oftentimes with Parkinson's disease, we see that um, these folks end up taking smaller and smaller steps. Um, they, all of their, the things that we kind of take for granted become very small with them. So even their voice speaking becomes very, very low. They become what's called hypophonic. Their movements are very small. They're very rigid. They, uh, they're very slow. It's called bradykinesias. They're very slow with their movements. There's postural instability as they kind of, um, everything slows down and becomes small. You, you become flexed and very kind of in, in towards yourself. There's a resting tremors, um, dysarthria, so issues with their, with their speaking. There's co definitely cognitive decline with memory and um, executive functioning. Spatial uh, awareness becomes a bit off. Definitely, so now if you're, uh, if you're losing your general mobility as everything kind of shrinks down, you're gonna lose your balance. Your balance um, definitely becomes um, 
decreases. And then there's another phenomenon called gate freezing where they, uh, a person with Parkinson's can be walking and then suddenly stop and kind of do what's called festination where their feet are kind of shuffling in place because they don't have the, um, the, the, the neurons that are working to promote the next movement. So there's that, that planning that happens, that naturally happens, we don't even have to think about, it's automatic to take that next step after that next step, they're losing that ability, right? Um, which also makes dual tasking, doing two things at one time, very difficult. So all of these impairments that we just discussed really it, it restricts someone's functional and, and independence, right? If you can't balance, if you can't get up and walk, if you're losing your memory, then your quality of life is going to deteriorate. You're going to have to rely on someone else um, for to do some of these simple tasks, dressing, bathing, uh, being able to get up and walk. You're at a higher risk for falls. Uh, falls can lead to brain injuries, um, fractures, death, and definitely psychological trauma. And there's a high risk, risk uh, sorry, high fear of falling as well in this population. So currently the treatments are administration of medications, levodopa, which basically um, uh, what's missing in, in, the, in the patient's brain, it kind of fulfills that to keep them moving more normally. Um, there's non-pharmacological -ph treatments um, for cognitive retraining, rehabilitation, and then deep brain stimulation. All things that we don't really quite do as physical therapists, but we have our own alternative um, forms of treatment. If anyone's ever heard of LSVT big for speech and then also for, for movement. Um, and then there's been a lot of research that shows that uh, using dance, actually dance and rhythm, so music, um, even with like just using a metronome can really help patients with their mobility um, it minimizes the, the Parkinson's disease effects, um, which can be uh, effective in improving their gait, their, their ability to walk, excuse me. And it also provides that, again, that social and emotional well being, which always is going to improve quality of life. So these are two separate studies um, looking at the effects of dance on patients with Parkinson's disease, right? So, the first one um, is looking at gait speed, so how quickly someone can, can walk after a 12-week dance intervention for patients or participants with mild to moderate impairment due to Parkinson's disease. So what they did was they did uh, a 75-minute dance class once a week, and they measured, um, they looked at two major measurements that we as therapists use. One is called the Berg Balance Scale, and the other one is the Tug. So the Berg is basically a whole list of ba different balance activities, standing on one leg, standing on two feet, eyes closed, eyes open, turning this way, turning that way. And then you score the patient based on how likely they are to fall, or if they're able to do this, these tasks almost independently, um, or if they actually need physical assistance to maintain their balance while you're, they're performing these, these little tests. Right, and this, this is scored out of 56. So the higher their score, the higher they are to a 56, the lower their risk for falls. And then the tug is called the timed up and go. So this is where the patient starts sitting down. They, you, you tell them go, they stand up, walk around uh, a cone or a piece of tape or whatever marker and then walk back to the chair and sit. You're timing them. So you're timing them to see how quickly they can perform that. Usually if it's under uh, 13 seconds, they're, they're good, right? They're at a or low risk for falls. So they're looking at these two different outcome measures in the patients. And what they noticed was that the, those that did this dance intervention versus those that did not showed a real a great improvement in both in both short-term and long-term improvements on these scores. So on their balance, the Berg balance score that I just mentioned, and on their timed up and go, their speed, right? How quickly they can get across, turn, and come and sit back down in the same spot. Then for the second study, uh, this is looking at the effects of dance therapy versus uh, just traditional rehabilitation. Traditional meaning working on your balance, working on your strength, working on your walking alone, right? So we're looking at a group that actually did performed a, a dance therapy intervention versus a group doing just regular traditional therapy or rehab. Um, and this is looking more at their motor and cognitive um, uh, 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 piece, right? 
Um, so basically they looked at 16 patients who all had a history of falls for the dance therapy intervention. They performed one hour twice a week of dance versus the traditional rehab group did one hour twice a week of just traditional rehab. Um, that could be like straight leg raises, standing with your eyes closed, whatever you know the therapist decided to do with them as part of a traditional uh, rehab setting. And so the results are that in the, in the dance therapy group, but not in the traditional rehab group, there were significant improvements both in motor and cognitive outcomes for the six minute walk test and the timed up and go. So for the six minute walk test, that's basically your timing for six minutes, how far your patient or that person can walk. So how much distance they can cover. So that's looking at your endurance, um, your walking ability, speed, all of those things. And then the timed up and go is how quickly you can get from that chair again around that cone back to your seat. So that's looking at speed. And these are all markers that we use as therapists to look at risk for falls, um, gait speed, whether the patient's gonna be a mostly indoors household ambulator versus being able to go out into the community. So we use these, these things as to, to measure um, a person's ability to function in, in the world, right? And so what they found again, uh, just to recap, is that in the dance therapy group, they saw significant improvements, um, but not in the traditional rehab group. So there is a space for dance, um, especially with the, with the Parkinson's disease patients. Uh, two additional studies looked at music therapy um, and dance for specifically for gait. Um, so this one looked at 40, for this is a systematic review, which is one of the highest levels of research, right? They're looking at all of the research um, and kind of uh, going through a meta-analysis to look at what the outcomes are. So they looked at 45 different studies and found that rhythmic stim stim stimulation using music and dance minimized the negative effects of Parkinson's disease, right? All those things we talked about before, like freezing, uh, loss of balance, rigidity, slow movement, and improved their overall gait quality, their cognition and their social well being, which ultimately improves what? Quality of life, QOL. The second study is looking at the effects of adapted tango on spatial cognition. So kind of like that visual spatial perception, right? So tango is kind of fun, right? That Argentine tango. Um, so this one looked at 33 participants who had mild to moderate Parkinson's disease, and they went to a 20, 90 minute tango or nine education lessons over a 12 week period. So this is three months of, you know, really doing some, some maybe not so intense, but some long tango lessons. And what they found were only the tango participants, not the controls, improved in their spatial cognition, their balance and their executive functioning. And, and when they checked them another 12 weeks after this intervention, these patients or these people maintained those gains after 12 weeks. So it really just goes to show that there is a space for dance um, to reduce the deleterious effects of Parkinson's disease. To sum that all up for this population, the benefits of dance are improved balance, spatial awareness, gait. We can also say cognition, right? Um, and that visual perception. So because dance is non-invasive, it, it can be used as a simple treatment option to promote well-being and overall improve the quality of life for people with Parkinson's disease. Uh, so the next group that we'll look at is multiple sclerosis. This is another um, neurodegenerative disease that we often see in the rehab and also in outpatient and definitely inpatient as well. So this disease affects primarily affects the central nervous system. Um, it can definitely affect people between the ages of 20 to 40, but also thereafter. Unfortunately, it affects more women than men and the onset is quite abrupt, right? It affects vision. There's limb weakness. It can be in the upper extremities or lower extremities. There, are, there is a bowel and bladder component where patients um, be, can, can become incontinent, uh, which can also affect their gait, um, especially if there's weakness in the limbs. Um, oftentimes these patients can end up in power wheelchairs, which we order that equipment for them and get them set up. 
And one of the biggest things that um, in patients with MS is fatigue. There's this complaint of fatigue, feeling tired. Um, so the research shows that for, for this population, it's important to do intermittent exercise or intermittent bouts of activity as opposed to kind of going through something uh, straight through. Um, they, they benefit from, you know, maybe two or three minutes of exercise at a time as opposed to one long session. And just so you know, there are four different types of MS. Uh, there's clinically isolated, which means that you might've had one flare that showed that there's MS and then it just quickly kind of disappears. The one that's most prominent that we often see is relapsing remitting where there's some uh, decline in function, uh, but then you can actually uh, regain some, really make some improvements and go for a while in, in one direction and keep going on with your life maintaining that level and then there's another decline and then a rebound so it's, it's not as not the worst of the diseases um, and then the next one will be secondary progressive and then primary progressive and those pretty much uh, there's like a almost steady decline in function as far as treatments go for uh, multiple sclerosis um, med medication is one of the biggest um, any type of disease modifying therapies and using physical rehabilitation. So how does dance, uh, how does dance come about in this world? Well, this study back in 2018 looked at using a targeted ballet program to mitigate ataxia. Ataxia is basically um, discoordinated movement um, to improve balance in females with mild to moderate multiple sclerosis. So this is a pretty small sample size, we'll keep that in mind. But nonetheless, um, these eight participants had mild to moderate disability from the relapsing remitting type of MS, right? That's that one where you decline, you, re you rebound, you decline, you rebound, you decline, but you rebound, right? So um, these folks met twice a week and performed 60 minute sessions for a total of 16 weeks. Now they didn't kind of fine tune the details, but I would assume that whomever was performing this intervention um, made sure that these patients got rest breaks because 60 minutes of straight movement for someone with MS, not gonna happen, right? We talked about fatigue, they fatigue very quickly. Um, so breaking up that activity into short bouts is, is most uh, appropriate. The instructors were classically trained ballet dancers, and they also had a research assistant to uh, provide balance and guidance and support. So what was interesting and what I liked about this study is that they, they did give a nice outline of what the class looked like. Where that's often one of the cases is, you know, with these studies that you look at, they give you all of the results and information, but not really what exactly happened in that intervention. You said you did this, but what were the real intricate pieces? So this, this provided a nice, outline. Um, it, it spoke about doing a full seated body warm up, um, seated ballet technique. So if anyone's ever done that, a lot of footwork, leg work. Um, then they did exercise and standing at the bar. So basically that ballet bar that you hold on to, and then exercises moving across the floor, and then a cool down. So they kind of adapted or modified a traditional ballet class so that these people could participate safely. And so what they found as a result was that there was an improvement in ICARS, which stands for International Cooperative Ataxia Rating Scale. And that basically is looking at um, the patient's level of ataxia. Uh, again, that discoordinated movement. And they also looked at the mini best, which is another type of test that we use to look at balance. Um, they looked at postural control, meaning how you are able to hold yourself um, in space People with postural control deficits may sit to one side or not be able to even hold their head up or hold their body up in the right position in order to perform daily life. They were looking at dynamic gait. So being able to move, not just in a straight path, but being able to turn your head, look right and left, up, down, change speed, take a step back, take a step forward. Things we take for granted because we're all dynamically walking around every day and making quick, fast movements and uh, holding and carrying things, doing two things at once. Um, they looked at smoothness of movement. So not being so kind of uh, 
like I said before, that discoordination or that stop go or kind of like tremors when you're moving and, and uh, balance in a step to stand task. So being able to step, take a step forward. So what they found was that the value of the mini best test improved by 42%. And again, that was looking at just overall general balance. Again, a, a, the outcome measure that we use as therapists. And 42% is nothing to scoff at. Um, so granted, this was a very small study size. It's something that should probably be further looked into, especially seeing that it made such a great improvement for these patients on, on their balance. Um, but another thing would be to follow up and see how they maintained those gains over the long term. But nonetheless, not discrediting it, still think it's a great, um, at least an intro study to look at um, the, the effects of, of dance on MS. And um, because they kind of laid out the outline of the class, so this could, is something that could be uh, replicated. And that's something that we're looking for. Okay, so we're gonna move to the next, um, next population. This is traumatic brain injury. We'll talk about brain injury for a moment. So with traumatic brain injury, that's usually any type of blunt penetrating um, injury, right? So um, think like motor vehicle accident or even just a fall. Many people, uh, especially if it's an older adult or even children uh, under two years old fall and they can hit their head and not know that they have they have a bleed in their brain or, or something called coup contra coup where the brain sits in this nice uh, sack in your skull and it gets kind of bounced around and that can cause very diffuse uh, injuries to the to the neurons and the synapses in your brain. Um, so what happens after the TBI is there's a, a decline in your level of awareness, maybe even consciousness. Sometimes people lose consciousness, right? If, if you don't lose consciousness, it might be considered a concussion. Um, there's memory loss, oftentimes memory loss, short-term and or long-term. There is definitely, uh, you'll see neurological abnormalities. So again, that limb weakness, one side of their body may not function, or maybe it's both sides. There could be visual deficits and definitely issues with uh, producing speech, sound, or talking in general. Um, some of these, some of these uh, effects may be temporary and can pass and patients improve and go back to living in totally normal life. And some of these have a more permanent basis where there you may see some improvement in certain areas, but some may take a lot longer to, um, to improve or not at all. And then, you know, memory loss, neurological disorder, dysfunction can limit activities and participation in daily life. Just the way that you function, it being able to get up out of bed in the morning by yourself, go brush your teeth, take a walk down the street, go to the grocery store. And not being able to do these things lowers quality of life. So the prevalence of TBI is 288,000 hospitalizations for TBI every year. And what are the leading causes of a non-fatal TBI? Like I said before, falls makes up 35%, motor vehicle accidents makes up 17%, and just a general strike or blow is another 17%. So looking to the literature, there is emerging evidence for dance and music in the traumatic brain injury pop <laughs> population, excuse me. So one of the interesting components is what's called the default mode network. This is basically where our thoughts, our memories, emotions, creativity, pain reduction, even listening to music, um, improvisation, and our narrative thinking, the thoughts in our head creating that story, and the experience of self and decision-making. This is where that's all occurring. It's uh, very closely tied to our hippocampus where learning and memory take place, being able to store memories and retrieve them, and then coordination between the brain networks or both hemispheres. So there is some evidence that there's um, the multimodal training, meaning using music and dance can help to reactivate memory and motivation. And there's some reorganization of the default mode network after tra traumatic brain injury, which is important for cognitive recovery, right? There's a, always a huge cognitive component after a traumatic brain injury. So um, here's a study. This is a just basically a case study. So it looked at one person 
there wasn't too much um, in the literature as far as traumatic brain injury. Um, but I did find one where they took a 19 year old who had sustained a motor vehicle accident and a subdural hematoma, which affected the occipital lobe, which where vision is held, the parietal lobe where all of our somatosensory cortex is and this patient was in a coma for two weeks in a minim minimally conscious state for many months after. This person did receive intensive rehab for about six months and then continued home therapy for five years to probably to maintain whatever gains and, and, and right, uh, the cortical reorganization that can continue to take place even after um, the first year, six months to a year of, of after the injury. So, this person was basically independent at the wheelchair level, meaning they could get themselves around um, it within, in their wheelchair, but needed mod to max assist for to ambulate about 20 meters. So that means that somebody else had to really physically help that person for their taking a step or holding them up, um, maybe using a device. They didn't quite specify, but one would assume. And so the intervention that they used um, was goal-directed dance rehab, right? Um, this person was, was a dancer in uh, his or her life. And so they already had this in, internal motivation to want to return to dance, right? Um, so what this intervention involved was basically saying, hey, person, we are going to put you in a dance competition and there is going to be 800 people in that audience watching you do this. So let's get it done, right? So that's that high high motivational goal, right? Okay, this is like, whoa, I haven't danced in years. I just sustained this crazy accident. I'm in a wheelchair. Now you're asking me to go perform this dance competition, right? So this is a highly motivational goal. Um, so this person underwent 60 minutes of dance lessons once a week, but for 20 weeks. So really 20 lessons. It was guided by a professional dance, dance uh, dancer. Um, and the, the PT, the, the physical therapist, facilitated the patient to go through these movements. Um, some of the outcome measures that they included, meaning what they, the, the parameters that they were looking for to see that there was change being made was the FIM, which is a fun functional independence measure, and then EEGs of the patient's DMN brain networks, those brain networks that we were just talking about where uh, the left and right hemispheres are communicating, and uh, there's memory and all of that interesting stuff. Um, and then just general neural observation by a neuropsychologist. So we had three key components, the patient, well, for the patient themselves, the professional, professional dance teacher, the PT, and then this neuropsychologist who's watching. And so here's sort of a schematic of, of the patient kind of being led by the PT, the dancer who's assisting, and then all of the, the components that go into this, right? There's a visual component. They're hearing the sound of the music. There's touch from one person's body to the other. And then there's that uh, positional and postural awareness. And then the brain is having to, to take all of this information that's coming in and integrate it and to deliver an actual fluid movement, right? And that, that's going down into the muscle to make the muscles work, to take that step, to kick whatever the choreographer is intending. Okay. And so the results of this study, um, these are all observations that were made by the neuropsychologist, revealed improvements in one, alertness. So the patient's um, ability to stay awake, alert, um, focused on the activity at hand, um, coping, so the ability to uh, adapt and get through the task and then perform this in the, the whole intervention and actually make it through to the end. Uh, Self-awareness, which is really crucial, especially for people with any type of brain injury or neuro, actually really any, everybody needs to be self-aware um, to know that there's something that needs to be worked on, something that needs to be fixed or uh, improved. And then self-reflection, being able to look at your performance and know how to improve it for the next time. And so what was found was that uh, when they looked at the FIM scores, the functional independence measures, this patient increased from 55 to 71, huge jump, which is about a 29% increase, and was able to actually maintain that uh, 
that increase up to 24% for two and a half years after that intervention. So that one 20 week period of doing all that dancing, that person gained almost 25%, a quarter improvement for two and a half years thereafter. So imagine if they actually continue to do this dancing or um, repeated it again, you know, later on, they could, that person hit the quality of life would just continue to at least stay at an elevated level than where he had started. Another thing they found was looking at the EEG of the brain that the, uh, the DME networks were positively uh, correlated with the increase in the FIM scores. And the greatest um, improvements were made in the occipital, parietal, and temporal lobes. So that means vision, again, the, those regions on the parietal lobe, that somatosensory region, and temporal where our hearing and communication comes from. So all good things. So in summary, the benefits of dance in this TBI person population, it's providing a combination of men memory retrieval, multi-sensory intervention, right? Dance, movement, uh, they're visually taking in information spatially, physically, and tactile as well um, to the different multimodal regions of the brain. And through repeated rehearsal, they're they're restoring and strengthening the connections within and between the brain areas. So one of the populations that I've got had the chance to look at, oh, we're getting a little short on time, so I'll make this a little more brief. Um, basically, we all know patients or people who have had stroke. Again, this is a, another form of brain injury um, that affects you long term. So basically what I wanted to look at was the feasibility of performing a, a type of dance intervention for stroke patients um, uh, in rehab, but also in a home setting. That's one of the things that, that where we can really make a difference. Um, so here was basically just another study. I won't get into all of the details, but this is another study that looked at um, delivering dance for a subacute stroke population. And what they found was they used the, the Berg balance scale. So uh, they're looking at balance and cognition and just overall patient perception. Um, and what they found was, let's see what they found. Here they found <laughs> um, all of the patients basically received therapy and also this new, this dance class, this dance therapy. And all of the patients reported that the class was challenging but enjoyable. Their balance scores all improved and they benefited greatly from mutual motivation, socialization, and a great sense of accomplishment. Um, and then many of the participants who attended the class continued to do this intervention even in the outpatient once they were discharged from that rehab setting. So I won't get into this next study, but basically the benefits of dance in the stroke population is that it's fun, it's innovative, and it's a new approach to, uh, to increase the treatment intensity um, and implementation. Imp implementation of a modified dance class in an inpatient rehab setting is actually feasible for, the, for an individual in the subacute stage. I was even able to use it when I was on the stroke unit. Um, I definitely implemented every time, anytime I had to teach a class for, in a group setting, I got music out and had people dancing, starting with a seated warm up, getting them into the bars, and then doing some movement with me as their partner so that they were safe. And I had the aids assistance around also just to help um, for those who needed a little extra assistance to keep it safe. And I always got positive feedback. Participants you could see were having fun. And not only that, but they were connecting more with each other. They were opening up and speaking to each other. Um, and that's always great to get that socialization piece. So let's see if we have time. We only have a few minutes. So. I'll just quickly show you a video. We'll do like one minute of a video just so you can see what it looks like. Quite a unique opportunity yesterday at the Grand Rapids Ballet. Cool. We recently found out that they have what are what really called adaptive dance classes for people living with diseases like Down syndrome and Parkinson's. It's amazing to see how dance, getting moving, and listening to the music can really help the human psyche and body. You want to check it out. Okay, we all know how beautiful ballet can be, but it also can be therapeutic. And we're here today at the Grand Rapids Ballet Company with Amanda Sikowski. You are the administrative director here yes. at the school. Tell us about this great new program that you have 
Adaptive Dance, what's that about? Adaptive Dance is a wonderful program that I've developed with the Grand Rapids Ballet Company to include dance for everyone. Dance is a wonderful way to express your feelings, to get your body moving, to have fun, and to work with other people in the community. And I'm a firm believer that dance is for everybody and everybody. And so I've created classes for children with Down syndrome, that's our Explorer Dance program, and our Dancing with PD, it's a class for adults with Parkinson's. And we've partnered with Spectrum Health Foundation on these classes. Trying it out for the first time, Pat Vanis with her husband Don, who's been diagnosed about 18 months now with Parkinson's. Right. Tell me why did you decide to come down here and try out this class? I just thought it would be real good for my husband to keep him mobilized. I want him to keep as mobile as he possibly can for as long as he can. And I'm guessing there are a lot of doctor's appointments, a lot of different kinds of physical therapy, but what's appealing about having movement and music? I, it's the music and I think just it is, doesn't seem so much like rehab, it seems like a fun thing. Seems like a fun thing for him and for you yeah, too, for I'm guessing. Too. I was yeah. going to say, he's yeah. never really much of a dancer, but maybe you're changing that now. Sure. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'll stop that there. Just just to give you all a quick preview. Oh, where did my presentation go? Um, um, of what dance, uh, an adaptive dance class looks like. And again, just to see how folks um, sort of react to that. Um, I had a few other videos, but I'm gonna skip them for now. Um, but what I did wanna show you guys was uh, some of the resources. So right here in New York, um, there is a place called Dance for All Bodies. This is a nonprofit class that provides inclusive, accessible dance classes for free, and it's virtual. They do anything from chair tap, contemporary ballet, Brazilian, mindfulness, salsa, you name it, they've got it. So um, if you have anyone that could benefit from like an adaptive dance class or even just to try it yourself, I definitely would suggest checking that out. And I have all the links here in the presentation. Another one that um, I found which is really great is Dance for Parkinson's Disease. Um, so this is uh, through the Mark Morris Dance Company. They have basically done an extensive research. They have whole trainings to become an instructor and everything. Um, but basically for people living with Parkinson's disease and for their families to explore dance um, and different types of movement styles, again, free in New York City. And then uh, someone from Sinai actually brought to my attention that there's a program called Tap on Tap, which is an all-inclusive dance tap ensemble right here at Sinai. So there's the link to check that out as well, or if you know someone that could benefit. And then um, Working in the outpatient, I came to discover that there are many weekly virtual classes. Now, a lot of them are tailored for people with spinal cord injury, but we're trying to really expand and branch out and open up um, for more for traumatic brain and stroke patients because there are a ton of people just that need something to do that's not traditional rehab. Um, and so here is just a list of the different classes going on throughout the week. So please take advantage, send it to your patients or people that you know. There's a meditation group. Garrison Red, he is our contact. He's fantastic and wonderful. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to him um, because he's kind of running all these different programs and, and coordinating. There's a fitness exercise class on Tuesdays. There's also a caregiver support group. So for people with brain injury or stroke, um, a brain injury support group. So if people with brain injury can come together and actually um, speak to each other, which I think is also very therapeutic aside from dance. Um, and then a boxing class, which again, is just a, another, another form of exercise that can be fun. Um, and because these classes are virtual, anyone can attend from their own home, which is great. And so the takeaway message for the, all of this is that basically dance is a promising therapeutic tool. There's feasibility involved, it's sustainable, it can be adaptable, enjoyable, and provide good adherence for our patients. So without further ado, I know it's running late, but if you have any questions, I'll turn it over to Tiffany to handle that. All right, so we do have a question just in regards to Parkinson's. Uh -huh. um, so you said that people turn like inwards when they get Parkinson's. So at those advanced stages, did you find um, dance and exercise to be beneficial to those people who had Parkinson's at the advanced stage? That's a really good question, actually. So by, by the time they get to the later, later stages, um, patients become so rigid that they really 
it, they ultimately become bed bound. So it really depends on where in the later stage you're talking. Um, I find that the, the best improvements patients can make are somewhere right in the middle where you're seeing that there's a decline, but before they get to that later end, you can still make improvements in their life and their quality of life. Even if they have pretty moderate impairments like needing assistance to walk or ambulate, um, there's still a room for improvement. And maybe it's not, maybe dance isn't the answer for, for them if they're uh, more, if they need more assistance or they're a little bit have progressed in their disease process. But even coming and doing physical therapy, there's also the LSVT big program. Um, and, and just getting with a, a phys physical therapist can, who can teach maybe some adaptive techniques um, to help that patient or that person improve in their mobility and just stave off uh, that decline a little bit longer. Oh, thank you for that. That was really informative. Um, so it looks like we are just about out of time, running a little bit over. So we want to thank all of those that stayed to the very end. Um, and we want to thank, give Melissa a big thank you. This was great. This was a great presentation. Um, and like she said, movement is medicine. I see it every day in just my life. So I can imagine it in the lives of everyone else, and especially people with uh, brain injuries. So again, thank you, Melissa. Thank you all for joining. Um, if you can, we would like ask for your feedback and know what your thoughts of are of of this session right uh, so if you can please scan the qr code uh, that is on the screen and take our quick survey just to tell us what your thoughts are um, we are wrapping up our Disability Awareness Month event again, uh, with our last event being tomorrow, and that is uh, Fostering Health Equity for People with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, and that is from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. So again, we want to thank you, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Tiffany. <laughs>